We finished last week in Exodus 38, 21. Now, somebody just told me, I didn't know, that there's only 40 chapters in Exodus, so we're right here coming towards the end. I guess I probably did know that. But uh, who knows what comes after our Exodus study is over? Leviticus. So we will continue our Torah study in the Torah. And so as we, as we uh, begin to, to understand how God assembled this place for His presence, and this was all about preparing a place for the Lord. Now, for those of you that traveled around with us when we were at uh, Cathedral of the Cross and Mountain Chapel, and then we were over at Disciples Fellowship on Lorna Road for about a year uh, as we held a Bible study over there, we, we were a tabernacle. We were a traveling tabernacle. Laura and I would, uh, every Friday morning, we would load up the SUV. We would put the Torah in it. We would put all of the items, sedors, uh, flyers, flags, uh, offering bags. We would load up one uh, tub after another uh, and drive over to Birmingham. And we would always have a large bottle of Febreze because the room we were in smelled like feet. And we would come in and we would set all that up. And then at about 4 o'clock on Friday afternoon, people would start coming to help us with uh, coffee and with, with the setup there. And by 6 o'clock, we were pretty much ready, ready to go. Uh, Diane and the team were, were set there. We had the music set up for them. And uh, we were portable. And at the end of the service, at 10.30 or quarter to 11 at night, everything would get packed back up, put on carts, and rolled back out to the car. Uh, we would then have, uh, for the time we had Bible study, we would have the car loaded up at Bible study on Saturday morning. And right after lunch on Saturday, we would drive back to Atlanta, and we would load it back into our home, into our garage, which was the housing for the tabernacle. And so we did that month in and month out. We started doing it once a month for a year, and then for a period of 10 months, we did it twice a month uh, until we found our home at Mountain Chapel where we could actually rent a trailer and drop it on the property, but we were still portable. We had to set up and tear down and load up the trailer every week. So we began to understand that, and we did it in a particular way. And for those of you that work side by side with me, you knew that the flags went in a certain place. And the ark went in a certain place. And the light over the ark was put in a certain place in a certain way with two extension cords hung this particular way. And everybody said, well, it's so specific, Rabbi. It's so, you're so specific. You, you know, you want it there. You know, what, 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 what's the big deal if it's over here? Well, the big deal is, is that there's a particular order. And it wasn't such a big deal as we wanted to get into a pattern that people could be trusted to repeat, even if I wasn't there, to supervise it that people would know that the congregation would continue even if I was not there to say, nope, this goes here and that goes there and this goes here and that goes there. And people began to bubble up that were responsible that said, okay, I have responsibility for this and I know this is where that goes. Nope, 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 it doesn't go there, it goes there. And when you do the flag, do the flag this way, so when you turn it, you see the Star of David sitting out. Okay. Well, you can, put the flag in a, you can put the flag on the pole and the pole on the stand, and you can just put it up there and walk away, but it may be that the Star of David's not showing. Well, we want things to be done in a particular way. Well, this is not a new pattern. This is a very old pattern. This is the pattern that God had, and God continued to check and have Moses check. And you remember, they brought everything to Moses, and they said to Moses, here, here's what we made. And he goes, okay, he's examined it, and he checked it, and he double-checked it, and he makes sure that it was in accordance with the instruction. And over and over again, we see that they did everything that the Lord commanded them through Moses. And so now we're getting to the point where we see that there is a particular order, that God is the God of decency and of order. And when he says he wants it to be this length, not only does he want it to be this length, but he wants somebody to check to be sure it's this length. Because God does not inhabit the junk. God inhabits the holy place. He inhabits a place that says this is made and conforms to what I have asked to be made and how I want it made and in conformance to what I've asked for. And if you'll do this, I'll be present with you because I know I can trust you. These seem to be difficult tasks. These seem to be difficult challenges. Does it really have to be 15.0 cubits long, plus or minus nothing? 
And the answer is yes, it does. It means don't bring me something more and don't bring me something less because if I can't, cut you to, if I can't trust you to cut and measure according to this, how can I trust you to inhabit a land I give you and not defile that land? How can I trust you to not make idols for yourself or get swept up in deception or, get, or, or, or lose all these things I gave you if I can't trust you with the task I've given you, with the assignment I've entrusted you with? Very specifically in things that are tangible, something tangible, something you can actually see because when I start talking to you about spiritual things that you cannot see and I start talking to you about doing battle in the spiritual realm against things you cannot see, how can I trust you to execute and take authority over them when you can't take authority over a rock or, or a piece of wood or a piece of metal? I'm giving you these tangible lessons so that I can entrust you with the much bigger things which is not grieving the Holy Spirit which is keeping my commands, which is understanding that everybody doesn't walk around with a Torah under their arms. That if I can give you these instructions and I can give you a pattern of how things are to be done, I can then trust you to follow that pattern when it becomes a part of you. When you have ownership of it, when you live it, when you think it, when you breathe it, when it's your natural response, then I can entrust you with it. And when it becomes part of your fabric of your being, and when you recognize and say, oh, that's not right, when you have an unction, a quickening of the Spirit right here in the, in the kishkas, right here in your guts, and you know something's not right, how do you know it's not right? Because it's a quickening of the Spirit. You instantaneously in the spiritual can match up against the pattern God gives you to overlay it and say, that's not right, to instantly know that's not right. How do you know that? Because the pattern and the form has been established, and you know when something's out of place. How many of you know when your desk has been messed with, or when your kitchen's been messed with, or when somebody else has been there? You know it because things are moved around differently. The pattern is no longer the same. Does that mean you're OCD? It does not mean you're OCD. Okay, now if you walk by every time, and like Wayne used to do to Dick Vignell, and move his pens like that, okay? <laughs> Okay, all right, that's just tormenting him, okay, okay, all right, but the truth of the matter is everything doesn't have to be perfect, but everything needs to be orderly, okay, and God wants us to conform to the pattern that He establishes. He does not want us to conform to the patterns of the world, and these are much bigger spiritual lessons, and we think that, oh, there's, there's chapter and verse and chapter and verse, and He's so specific. How important can it possibly be? Well, over the period of time in which they made it, it became more and more important. And in the beginning, it was just Moses that was responsible. But then he called two others to say, okay, you now in charge of this. And then he called others and said, and here, and he began to divide the work because he could trust the one who then could trust the others, who could then speak into the others. And then ultimately, he put judges in leaders over a thousand, hundreds, tens, and people could be entrusted to carry out the work of God's economy. And so this pattern of the tabernacle is much larger than just this space in which God would occupy. He set the pattern for us to live our lives, conforming to a standard which He established so that we would know how to measure up. How can I, go, how can I if I don't have a yardstick, how do I know what three feet is? Oh, well, I take three paces and that's a yard. Well, my three paces and your three paces are different. So we establish standards by which to measure. For Congregation Bethlehem, this is the standard by which we measure. And when you have God's Word as the standard in which you measure, you don't get off track. It's not my interpretation of the Word. And if it's based on the interpretation of the world, that means every congregation and every leader has a different standard. So why do we embrace the clear meaning of the Word of God? Because that gives us one standard. We all agree that if it says 12 inches or 12 cubits or 12 meters or 12 feet, it means that. That's what it means. And so as a clear meaning kind of look at the, at the Word of God, as we look at what He's doing we begin to see that what He's established 
He says, if you will do this, I will dwell with you. And if you don't do it this way, I will not. That's pretty clear. If you build my house on a firm foundation of rock, I will dwell with you, and it will not, when the, when the rains come, it will not wash away. But if you build it on shifting sands, when the weather comes, it's going to be washed away. Well, we understand that from a foundational perspective. Why don't we understand that from a tabernacle perspective? This was portable. The people had to move. They had to move from Egypt into the promised land, and the path they took was a path that was a circuitous path. Now, how many of you ever heard the term mosey? Okay. Oh, they were just moseying along. I'm just going to mosey along. Very anti-Semitic, by the way. As if Moses was an aimless wanderer, not following the leading of God. The way I read this book, God took them on a path. He kept, them from the, kept Moses from the promised land for his disobedience. He wasn't aimlessly wandering. He did and went exactly where God told him to go, and he went where God told him and how he was supposed to go and what path he was supposed to take because if I read this correctly, when the cloud moved and went before them, they followed the cloud. So was he lost? Was he an aimless wanderer? Was his path made up by himself because he never looked in the back of the Ten Commandments like his wife kept telling him and saying, well, look, the map is right there. Okay. If you just pull over and ask for directions, okay, we would get there a whole lot faster. Okay. Next time Wayne and Diane make a trip to Tampa, you should call them. Okay. It's a very interesting conversation on the phone. Okay. Hello, Diane. What did Wayne say now? Well, we're now in North Carolina. <laughs> well, I thought you were going to Tampa. Well, we are, but he just wouldn't listen. <laughs> so this impression we're left by the world that Moses was an aimless wanderer, that this 11-day journey that took them 40 years was because Moses was dis disobedient or in disarray or all these things, and it's a very anti-Semitic view. He followed God and where God led him. It said, God went before them and prepared the way. When the cloud moved, they followed the cloud. That means God was in front. And because they didn't do everything God asked them to do, and because people strayed and because people wandered, what happened? That generation died in the desert. Their biggest fear, just like we read in Job, that which I feared the most has come to pass. That's which I proclaimed for myself, the words I spoke. Why did you take us out of Egypt? Are we going to die in this desert? Well, bam, you are. Because of your disobedience. Because you didn't do what you were asked to do. But those that did what they were asked to do inherited the promised land. And the inheritance was clear. And so this pattern and this conforming to the pattern of God, do we not read that in the New Covenant Scriptures? Do not be conformed to this world, to the patterns of this world, be set apart be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Is that not what it says? Well, isn't this the pattern God gives us? He establishes right here in the Torah. So was Paul and were the apostles and the disciples of Yeshua espousing some new teaching? Was this some new learning? Oh, don't be conformed to the patterns of the world. No, it was in conformance and in exact instruction for what God laid out in the tabernacle. Is it symbolic of all these other things that these symbolic teachers are telling you? No, it's symbolic of God's pattern. It's, it's conforming to what God shows us. He gives us specific instructions. He lays out a pattern for us, and He said, this is how I want you to do it. This is what I want you to do, and this is how I want you to do it. And if you do this, I will bless you. If you do this, I will not leave you. My presence will never leave you. And when somebody dies, we always say, well, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. As if you have to die to be in God's presence. Okay? Now the Word of God says that, okay? that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I say to you, to be in His house is to be present with the Lord. To conform to the patterns of His tabernacle, to the instructions He gives you for your life is to be present with the Lord. Because if you will create that holy place, He says He will dwell in His temple forever. You've been told you are the temple of the Lord. 
And so if you're the temple of the Lord, we've got 100 temples gathering in one temple. It means not only is God with each one of you, but He's with all of us. He's in this place. And so if that's the case, I don't have to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. When I am absent from the body, I will be present with the Lord, but I can be present with the Lord in the living condition because I'm conforming to the tabernacle and to the pattern He's given us. And so this story about the tabernacle, about how God creates a dwelling place, is a specific set of instructions for us. God is in the details. He cares about the little things. He cares about what material you make something out of. Because He will show you how to make the imperishable out of the perishable. He will show you that your body is made out of dirt. Don't think so highly of yourselves. Okay? You're all made out of dirt just like I am. But to take what is perishable and make it imperishable. And he shows us by taking wood clad with gold, wood clad with bronze, wood clad with copper. Because it will never decay. It doesn't decay from the inside out, it decays from the outside in. And so if it's clad with something that doesn't decay, it will never decay. Why is it that we believe that the Ark of the Covenant still exists? Because it was wood which could not last for 4,000 years, but wood clad with gold and lined with gold is imperishable. It will never decay. Water will never get into it. It will never decay over time because it has become, what has been perishable has become imperishable. And so God's done that with us. When we invite the Holy Spirit inside of us, we're aligned with gold. When we conform our lives to Messiah, our exterior is clad in gold. And therefore, the more perfect reflection of Messiah is seen in us, the more we walk with Him. And so God gives us that pattern. He shows us that pattern right here in the Word. And so as we continue in chapter 38, 21, these are the records of the tabernacle, the tabernacle of the pact which were drawn up at Moses' bidding, the work of the Levites under the direction of Ithamar, son of Aaron the priest. Now Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, had made all that the Lord had commanded Moses. At his side was Oholiab, son of Ahismach, of the tribe of Dan, carver and designer, embroiderer in blue, purple, and crimson yarns, and in fine linen. All the gold that was used for the work in all the work of the sanctuary, the elevation of gold, the elevation offering of gold came to 29 talents and 730 shekels by the sanctuary weight. Anybody have any idea how much that is? How much? Eight hundred and fifty pounds. Eight hundred fifty thousand ounces. Seventy pounds of gold. How many ounces in a pound? Sixteen ounces. So, do the math. Seventy pounds. That's uh, eleven hundred ounces at thousand dollars an ounce. How much is that? Eleven million. Is that what it works out to be, $11 million? 1,930 pounds. Somebody pulled out a calculator, do 1,930 pounds. Yes? I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. If somebody can go to a microphone, please, or if somebody can repeat louder. Very hard to hear coming this way. You can hear going that way, but this way there is no acoustic whatsoever. Okay, my Bible says... On the amount of gold that was collected from the people, 2,200 pounds. The amount of silver, 7,545 Okay, pounds. so let's take the gold. So that's 2,200 times 16 is how much? 2,200 times 16. Where's Mr. Ed? Twenty-two hundred pounds times sixteen ounces. 
35,200 and add three zeros on the end. $35,200,000 in today's value. Okay, so give me a number. All I want's a number. A lot. There you go. It's a lot. Right. Thir about $35 million. Now do you see why people want the ark? Right, just as an artifact, but just for the gold. So the silver of those of the community who were recorded came to 100 talents and 1,775 shekels by the sanctuary weight, a half shekel ahead, half a shekel by the sanctuary weight, for each one who was entered in the records for the age of 20 years up to 20 years up, 603,550. Now, the half shekel temple tax, did that still exist at the time of Yeshua? It did. So remember, the pattern of the tabernacle became the pattern of the temple. As you look at an overlay and you do an aerial view of the temple, you see the tabernacle laying inside the temple. As you look at a, a, a mock-up of, of Jerusalem at the time of the temple, you see the pattern of the tabernacle. This was always to be the pattern. This is the pattern of the first temple. This is the pattern of the second temple. It will be the pattern of the third temple, and it will be the pattern of the fourth temple. And in fact, you're sitting in a place that happens to be patterned after. I can assure you that those at Shades Mountain Bible Church that originally designed this weren't thinking that. Actually, their design is it's an upside-down ark. And if you take a look, there's the flip it over and you're in an ark. Okay? That's why the outside there is wood. That's why you have the front of the boat here. Okay? And so you flip it over, you're in the ark. And it was designed that way to be an ark. But it's in the pattern and the shape with the, court, with the temple steps and with the courtyard, and with everything as designed from the temple. So the architect that drew it up had this vision for an upside-down ark, but yet it's in the pattern, length and width and design of the tabernacle. The 100 talents of silver were for casting the sockets of the sanctuary and the sockets for the curtain, 100 sockets to the 100, sockets to the 100 talents, a talent, a socket. And of the 1,775 shekels, he made hooks for the posts, overlay, overlay for their tops and, and bands around them. The copper from the elevation offering came to 70 talents and 2,400 shekels. Of it, he made the sockets for the entrance of the tent of meeting, the copper altar and its copper grating and all the utensils of the altar, the sockets of the enclosure round about, and the sockets of the gate of the enclosure and all the pegs of the tabernacle and all the pegs of the enclosure round about it. Chapter 39, of the blue, purple, and crimson yarns, they also made the service vestments for officiating in the sanctuary. They made Aaron's sacral vestments as the Lord had commanded Moses. Now, once again, we see this is a confirmation. We had God's instruction as they were building it and making these items. Okay? They repeated what they were making in accordance with the instruction. Now, this is the summary confirming for the third time that these things were done in accordance with the instruction God had given. So we know without question God gave these instructions, the craftsmen did it according to the instructions, and now they're confirming here that these instructions were followed. The ephod was made of gold, blue, purple, and crimson yarns and fine twisted linen. They hammered out sheets of gold and cut threads to be worked into designs among the blue, the purple, and crimson yarns, and the fine linen. They made for it attaching shoulder pieces. They were attached at its two ends. The decorated band that was upon it was made like it of one piece with it of gold, blue, purple, and crimson yarns and fine twisted linen as the Lord had commanded Moses. They bordered the lazuli stones with frames of gold engraved with seal engravings of the names of the sons of Israel. They were set on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as stones of remembrance for the Israelites as the Lord had commanded Moses." First three paragraphs end the same way, as the Lord had commanded Moses, as the Lord had commanded Moses, as the Lord had commanded Moses. How many times do you think we're going to see that in this chapter? We're going to see it 18 times. The confirmation and the inspection of these items has to match the standard in which God commanded it. 
And so a check and balance system. How many of you ever get a garment or a piece of equipment and it has inspected by so-and-so and there's a couple of initials on there because it's inspected and re-inspected because one inspector does not make something valid. When I had a uh, defense contracting plant in California, we had to have three inspection stamps on every item. And all the tools had to be calibrated by three inspectors. And so there were three inspections done. Okay? And so that became the pattern because the first one could miss something, the second one probably didn't, and the third one if it confirmed it. We run two sets of accounting here so that all accounting is confirmed in two systems. Both systems have to match. If they don't match, I get a phone call. Right, Miss Laura? She nodded. You couldn't hear that. The breastplate was made in the style of the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and crimson yarns and fine twisted linen. It was square. They made the breastplate doubled, a span in length, and a span in width doubled. They set in it four rows of stone. The first row was a row of carnelian, chrysolite, and emerald. The second row, a turquoise, a sapphire, and an amethyst. The third row, a jacinth, an agate, and a crystal. And the fourth row, a barrel, a lapis lazuli, and a jasper. They were encircled in their mountings with frames of gold. The stones corresponded to the names of the sons of Israel, twelve corresponding to their names engraved like seals, each with its name for the twelve tribes. On the breastplate they made braided chains of corded work in pure gold. They made two frames of gold and two rings of gold and fastened the two rings at the two ends of the breastplate, attaching the two golden cords to the two rings at the ends of the breastplate. Do we have any pictures? We do. Then they fastened the two ends of the cords to the two frames, attaching them to the shoulder piece of the ephod at the front. They made two rings of gold and attached them to the two ends of the breastplate at its inner edge, which faced the ephod. They made two other rings of gold and fastened them on the front of the ephod, low on the two shoulder pieces, close to, the, to its seam above the decorated band. The breastplate was held in place by a cord of blue from its rings to the rings of the ephod, so that the breastplate rested on the decorated band and did not come loose from the ephod as the Lord had commanded Moses. The robe for the ephod was made of a woven work of pure blue. The opening of the robe in the middle of it was like the opening of a coat of mail with a binding around the opening so that it would not tear. On the hem of the robe they made pomegranates of blue, purple, and crimson yarns twisted. They also made bells of pure gold and attached the bells between the pomegranate all around the hem of the robe between the pomegranates, a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate, all around the hem of the robe for officiating in as the Lord had commanded Moses. They made tunics of fine linen of woven work for Aaron and his sons, and the headdress of fine linen, and the decorated turbans of fine linen, and the linen breeches of fine twisted linen, and sashes of fine twisted linen, blue, purple, and crimson yards, done in embroidery as the Lord had commanded Moses." They made the frontlet for the holy diadem of pure gold and incised upon it the seal inscription, Holy to the Lord. They attached it to a cord of blue to fix it upon the headdress above as the Lord had commanded Moses. Thus was completed all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. The Israelites did so just as the Lord had commanded Moses, so they did. Then they brought the tabernacle to Moses with the tent and all its furnishings, its clasps, its planks, its bars, its posts, and its sockets, the covering of tanned ram skins, the covering of dolphin skins, and the curtain for the screen, the ark of the pact and its poles and the cover, the table and all its utensils and the bread of display, the pure lampstand, its lamps, lamps in due order, and all its fittings and the oil for lighting, the altar of gold, the oil for anointing, the aromatic incense, and the screen for the entrance of the tent." The copper altar with its copper grating, its poles and all its utensils, and the laver and its stands, the hangings of the enclosure, its poles and its sockets, the screen for the gate of the enclosure, its cords and its pegs, all the furnishings for the service of the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, the, the service vestments for officiating in the sanctuary, the sacral vestments of Aaron, the priest, and the vestments of his son for priestly service. Just as the Lord had commanded Moses, so the Israelites had done all the work. And when Moses saw that they had performed all the task as the Lord had commanded, so they had done, Moses blessed them. So what took place? Each one of these people entrusted to make what they were entrusted to make. And now they brought it for final examination, for a final accounting. Does that mean that Moses didn't trust them? Did that mean that Moses was a micromanager and had to check everything they did? Moses was responsible. He was the man that God said, tell the people how to do this. 
And so, in order for him to release it for service to the Lord, he had to make sure that it was done as the Lord had commanded it. God has an order to things. He has a hierarchy to things. Now, imagine this. Yeshua calls together twelve. This is his inner circle. How many of you sat at King Arthur's round table? Anybody know? Nobody knows. I don't know. How many? Twelve. Okay, it would seem to be that the, the knights of the round table would be the same number as the disciples. God always has in His economy a trusted core of people. That's why in a congregation you have deacons and elders and you have a leadership team because the work has to be divided. In God's economy, Moses stood before the Lord and asked for help, and God appointed a number of people over a number of people. Within our government, we have X amount of people per X amount of population. Every state has two senators, but every state has a different number of representatives based on a percentage or a number of the people, one representative for every X amount of people. And so it is in congregations, so it is in corporations, okay? This economy that God has set up within the hierarchy of accountability means that somebody has to have the buck stop here, and somebody has to stand before the Lord. Within the family, it's supposed to be the father. Within the congregation, it's supposed to be the rabbi or the pastor, Here's a shock for many of you. It's not the board. It's not the committee. God doesn't want to deal with a committee. He wants to deal with a person. He wants to say, you're the head. And when he looks at you, he wants to see that everybody's lined up. He wants to see one line. He wants to see one congregation. He wants to see one family lined up behind him in the order he's established. If he sees a committee of 13, what's he going to be doing? Well, you come on over here, and you come on over there, and you line up over there. And how can I ever deal with the pastor or the rabbi if I have to deal with the committee? I can't go to the pastor or rabbi because I have to talk to the committee, and then the committee will call the rabbi? Well, then the committee's God. Then the board becomes God, and most boards that I've met act just like God. And they hire and they father, fire and they determine what the sermon series should be. And all of a sudden they become the Holy Spirit operating on earth. And so what happens is the gospel gets watered down because they want to be friendly. Or we want to have people stay. Or we want to preach this. Or we want people to do this. Or we have to have these kind of programs. So the committee directs what happens and what happens Okay? Oh, well, you know, we're, we're, we're having friction with the pastor, so let's get rid of the pastor. Anybody ever see that happen? Happens all the time. So when we have our new members class today and we talk about a theocracy in God's economy, I'm responsible. And let me tell you, the buck stops here. I preach a bad sermon or I preach something that doesn't line up with the Word of God, let me tell you, you don't have to come tell me about it. I've been up all night wrestling with the Lord, and so when I walk in here the next morning with a limp, <laughs> all right. don't ask me what happened. Because <laughs> you know what happened. Okay. I wrestled and I lost. But if you look at God's economy, he set up Moses. He called Moses. Oh, yeah, he called Moses the murderer. Wasn't Moses a murderer? He called Moses the disobedient and the arrogant. Oh, but this person isn't worthy of serving in this capacity. He's got a flawed past. He's made some mistakes. God makes it very clear he will have compassion on who he will have compassion. He will have mercy on who he has mercy. And these tests of man don't conform to the tests of God. By our standards, Moses couldn't have led anybody. He was a murderer. He ran away from his responsibility. He was just a shepherd boy. Sure, he worked in Pharaoh's house. He was adopted as his son. But at the age of 40, he went out and killed somebody. And when they found out about it, he fled for 40 years. And what did he do for 40 years? He was a shepherd. 
So when he took the lowly position, that's when God raised him up. When David was in the lowly position, God raised him up. When Messiah was in the lowly position, God raised him up. When we get in the lowly position, that's when God will raise us up. When we're in the lofty position, God will allow us to fall. The humble, God knows face to face. The proud, He recognizes from afar. Anybody hear that last night? The proud, He recognizes from afar because they're so lofty, they make themselves known. He can recognize them from far off. The humble... He knows them face to face. Moses' qualification was is that he became teachable. He'd come to the end of himself, and now he could be used of God. And even in his service to God, he argued with the Lord. And even during these exchanges in the desert as he stood before the Lord, even during the time of, the, of, of, of the, the people and the grumbling and complaining, he continued to petition to God. Even up on the mountain, he continued to petition to God. He had to intercede, but because he had favor. With that favor, he had access. Important lesson, with favor comes access. And because he had favor of the Lord, he had access to God that he could stand there and intercede on behalf of the people because in that favor he had access. God would meet with him. Even in Moses' disobedience, did God reject Moses? No. Did he still meet with him? Yes. Even in our disobedience, God will still meet with us if we have his favor. And once you have his favor, we, Moses has proven to us there's nothing you can do if God chooses you, nothing you can do to lose that favor. You can even argue with God and, in some cases, prevail. Jacob did. His name will no longer be called Jacob. It will be called Israel because he, he, he um, has striven with both God and man and has prevailed. He didn't die. As a matter of fact, he insisted that at the end of it, he said, I'm not going to be done until you bless me. You and I can wrestle. You want to go at it again? You want round two, best out of three falls? What do you want? Come on, bring it. Bring it. I'm not letting go. I'm not going to stop until you bless me. So in that kind of favor, you can wrestle with the Lord. Oh, you're going to limp. Okay, but God will bless you. And this is what he did with Moses. Moses the murderer. Moses the disobedient. Moses the arrogant. Moses the slow of speech. Moses the proud. And when Moses at 80 became Moses the humble, then he began to minister in his calling because it took that long to develop him. So would we put somebody into a leadership position? Would we anoint someone as the new pastor or rabbi of a congregation at 80? Surely not. Some of the congregations you've come out of have a mandatory retirement age of 65, let alone anointing somebody, laying hands on them at 80 for the beginning of their ministry. We wouldn't think of it. This is exactly what God did. We wouldn't think of somebody at 100. Imagine that. God comes into town, strolls into town, 100 years old, and says, hey, I'm ready to uh, answer the call of God. And you go, oh, well, I'm sorry, but our board wouldn't approve that. What's your name? Oh, my name is Abraham. My father was Terah. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sorry. You're too old for any service to the Lord. But I'm 80 years old, and I have great credentials. What's your name? My name is Moses. Okay, but you're too old to conform to our standards. Okay, because the board has requirements. And were you would, we wouldn't look at your resume and consider you for service here in the kingdom of God. You're too old. You have history. You're a murderer. You're disobedient. You're slow of speech. We can't use you here. You're too old. Sorry. Okay. In chapter 40, and the Lord spoke to Moses. Gee, he's still talking to him, even if he's old. (laughs) Saying, on the first day of the first month, you shall set up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. What is this God is doing? He's blessing the works of his hand. He's putting into service. At this point in time, everything has been ready for use by the Lord, but it has not yet been blessed. And now God is blessing the works of Moses' hand. Now, weren't there a lot of people involved in this process? There were. Is this where Moses gets up and gives a speech and says, I'd like to thank the academy? 
for this wonderful honor, and I want to thank my mom, okay? Because without my mom, I could have never done this, okay? No, it was the community that built this for the presence of the Lord. An individual recognition, an individual acknowledgement. First of all, would he have looked somebody over and somebody gotten offended? Of course he does. And every time I ever try to thank everyone, I miss out someone. Very hard to do because people are fragile. The truth of the matter is, is when we work for the common good, when we work for the glory of God, when each one of us does our part, and many hands makes for light work, and everybody does their part, then everybody receives the benefit and everybody receives the blessing. And if I acknowledge you from the beam, of God does not have to acknowledge you from heaven. If your reward is with man, with man God tells you your, your reward will not be from him. And if your punishment is from man, you won't get punishment from heaven or you won't get rewarded from heaven if you complain about it. But if you take it and you're quiet about it, well, then God will reserve a great blessing for you. So God blesses all the work of the hand. He says, place there the ark of the pact and the screen of the ark with the curtain. Bring in the table and lay out its due setting. Bring in the lampstand and light its lamps and place the gold altar and incense before the ark of the pact. Then put up the screen for the entrance of the tabernacle. God the micromanager. Where's all the resentment? What, don't you trust me to do it? I, you trusted me to make it. Now you don't trust me to put it in the right order. You told me how to do it. Why are you trying to tell me how to do it? Because we all tend to get resentful. We all tend to think it's our turf. We all tend to think it's our stuff. It's all about us. It's all about me. The truth of the matter, it's all about him. And we've got to get our fleshly agenda out of the picture in order to be of service to God. And if we allow ourselves to get offended in the process of serving the Lord, who are we serving? What are we doing it for? And who are we doing it for? We're doing it for our own reward. When we read in Revelation that the streets are paved with gold so, so pure that we don't see our reflection in it, God's showing us a pattern in which we should live our lives that the only reflection people see in us is a reflection of Messiah, the pure light of Messiah within us. That means if you're setting up a table and the cups are, on the, are, are in a place that's not conducive to the way we talked about the cups, and I say, please move the cups over there, and you go, <sighs> duly noted, won't ask you to move the cups again. Duly noted, you're offended. You can't be used in the service of God if you're walking with an offense. Is that about me? It's not about me. God knows every one of your buttons, and He will make sure that somebody comes along and pushes them. I promise you that. Someone will come along. If you've got a button, somebody will come along and push it. I tell you all the time that my kids could not find, remember where they left their shoes, but they knew where every one of my buttons was. And push them on demand. Well, that's exactly what happens in the service to the kingdom of God. If you're truly submitted, nothing will bother you. If it's not about you and it's all about the Lord, nothing will offend you in the service to the Lord. Nothing. We can set those tables up and we can put out everything that we can possibly think of. We can put out small plates so you don't take them. But you'll still stack them this high and they'll still fall over. Okay? And people say, well, you have the wrong size plates. No, we don't. Because in this new pattern with smaller plates, even the people at the end get something to eat. Because if you pile up that high on a nine-inch plate, nobody gets anything to eat. But if you pile up that high on a six-inch plate, everybody gets something to eat. Well, there's a method to our madness. And all of you that have continued to send me emails saying, oh, the plates are too small, okay? <laughs> Thanks for your email. And the person at the end of the line thanks you because they're getting something to eat. <laughs> I take great comfort in the fact that as I read the Word of God, I read all the way from the beginning to the end that even God didn't please everybody. So I'm comfortable with it. <laughs> I have good company. So he tells them, you shall place the altar. Oh, by the way, does it say please? 
Was God concerned about courtesy and was he, the instructions of the operation of the temple and the tabernacle and the congregation, as much as we endeavor in the moment to try to extend every bit of courtesy and every bit of patience and every bit of loving kindness and wrap everything in this sweet message, sometimes, it, sometimes the message is, pick that up. Sometimes that message is, can't talk now. But if we're going to get our feathers ruffled because in the moment, as you're walking through, I'm walking through, you're not acknowledged in the way you insist on being acknowledged, then I would encourage you to toughen up. There are much bigger things. As you extend your hand, and I'm focused on putting out that fire, and I don't take your hand, please don't get offended with me. If I walk past you and don't acknowledge you, accept my global apology for every time that happens because it will happen. And oh, by the way, there's times I walk by that you don't acknowledge me. Do you want to hear about it every time? You don't. It's time to get real. In God's economy, I don't see in the Bible much where it says, listen, if it's okay with you, I'd really like you to place the altar burnt offering before the entrance of the tabernacle. But if you think there's a better place, you, I don't want to hurt your feelings, and I want to make you feel like you have ownership of this and, and have responsibility. And I, I don't want to try to meddle on your business and do your job or make you feel like you're not capable of doing this. But So if it's okay with you, it's not how God set things up. He set up an order and he said, do it this way. Now, does that mean that God's a dictator? God's mean? God's a God of order. Guess what? When you walk into the restrooms at Beth Hillel, there's toilet paper and there's paper towels and there's soap in the dispenser and the bathrooms are clean and the trash cans are emptied. But as I look around, very few of you are the ones that do that. But many of you would come to me if there was no soap or there was no toilet paper. We take so much for granted. But in a system, all these things happen. Look around you. There's no light bulbs burn out, are there? And when you walk in here, the lights are on and everything's ready. There's a system. And when everybody does their part, nobody notices the system. Walk into your house. You walk into your house at night and you flip on a light switch and you fully expect without one thought that the power company is generating electricity. How many of you walk in the house and go, oh, praise the Lord, there's electricity today. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, power company. I'm going to call Alabama Power. Hey, thanks. I turned on the lights and they worked. <laughs> I so appreciate it. You don't, but let me tell you something. The first time you turn that light switch on, the light doesn't work. And you look around and the power is off. And you go, that power company. Man, what kind of reliability is that? That's exactly right. Jack says, pay the bill. But the truth of the matter is we take everything for granted because there's systems in place to make things run smoothly. How do you think that system runs? Well, there's people with instruction and people that serve and there's people that are hired and people that are paid to do certain things. And they're told, we want it done this way, we want it done this way, we want it done this way. When you go to your job and they say these are the standards of performance, you work for a dictator, you do. A benevolent dictator, he actually pays you to do it the way they want you to do it. And so there's systems set up. And if there wasn't a system set up, everybody would do it differently but collectively, we wouldn't be served. And so there's order, and God has an order to things. And so when He lays out that order and He wants it done this way, He wants it so that these things aren't a stumbling block. They're not a distraction. If you come into the house of the Lord, you know, we spent a great deal of money to try to regulate the temperature in here because people were too cold. It was very uncomfortable in the sanctuary. Now we have the controls in the back, and if it's too cold, I give them a this, and they bump it up. And I give them a this, and they turn it down. 
And we try to be very sensitive and we take the average of the temperature in the back and the temperature in the front and the temperature in the back and we average them out and we try to adjust it to a comfortable temperature where people aren't so cold anymore. But for the first couple of months that we were here, it was desperately cold and the only way you could do it was it was either on or off. Now, there's people responsible for monitoring that, and it should be transparent to you. You should say, well, I'm comfortable. I might be a little chilly at times, but overall, I'm comfortable. I'm not freezing like I used to be, or I'm not so hot like I used to be. But you don't think about it. You're just comfortable. Well, we have to set up those systems. We have to set up standards by which if this happens, then you do this. Well, God did the same thing. And it wasn't an if you please. It's this is the order in which it's done in. When you come into services, how many of you come in right at 7.30? Some of you do. Our services are based on that clock behind me or in front of me behind you. When it says 7.30, Wayne starts. We announce services start at 7.30. It doesn't say approximately 7.30. It starts at 7.30. By the temple clock, 7.30. Now, if you walk in at 7.35, you're going to walk into the middle of the Shalom song. You know that you missed the opening prayer and the lighting of the candles, but you still know where you are in the service because there's an order. And you're comfortable to walk in during the Shalom Psalm because there's an order. There's a pattern. God has patterns. And when we conform to those patterns, we have security that things are done the same way. Then we know that something's not wrong. If you were to walk into the building and come up to the building and all the lights were off at 7.30 on a Friday night, would you think something was wrong? You would think something's wrong. It's the first indication something's not right. It would give you an unsettling feeling. Oh, the parking lot's empty. Is something wrong? It's 7.30 on a Friday night. Did I miss something? Something's not right. It's unsettling. Or you walk into the building and you smell smoke. That's not regular. We don't smell smoke here. These are the alert system when things, when patterns are broken. God gives us patterns because then we find comfort in our patterns. And aren't we truly, God says, we're like sheep, all are like sheep. Well, the sheep are comfortable in the pen, the sheep are comfortable in the pasture, but when there's a wolf, when there's a stranger, when there's things out of order, the sheep are uncomfortable. And so we're sheeple. God recognizes us sheeple. And because we're sheeple, we respond to the same stimuli, and we find the same comfort in order when things are regular. When you go into your bathroom, when you go into your kitchen, into your house, you expect that when you open this cabinet, something will be there. If I came in every night and rearranged all your cabinets, okay, it'd be pretty unsettling. You know, Pastor Isa comes here. Isa's blind. Isa walks here from his house up on Alford Avenue. Issa's been walking over to this location, grew up in this neighborhood. He's been walking to the gas station. He's been walking to the area. He knows exactly which turns to make, and if they were to rearrange the streets, Issa would have a problem. If they moved a fire hydrant or a pole, Issa would have a problem because that's the pattern he's become used to as a blind person. This is here. It's X amount of steps to this. It's X amount of this to this. When he comes to Bethlehem, he comes in through a certain door, through a certain entrance, around the building to a certain way because that's the pattern in which he's become comfortable. And I've offered to drive him home many times, and he goes, no, thanks, I'll walk. I'm perfectly comfortable walking. Day or night, doesn't matter to him. He's perfectly comfortable because the path does not change for him. He's comfortable with it. Well, God's given us this pattern, and so he says, I want this here. Why? Because every time you set it up, I want it there. Every time you do this, I want it done this way. Why? Because when I go there, I will recognize it as my place. It's not a foreign place. Don't bring strange fire into there. It'll get you killed. Do these things as an everlasting covenant. My covenant with you will be secure. You will do what I ask you, and I will do what you ask of me. Doesn't it say when Yeshua came, whatever you ask of my Father in my name, I will do for you? Why? Because he recognizes you because you're conformed to his pattern. And so he gives us that pattern in the tabernacle so we understand that God's not to please, and oh, if you wish, God's a God of order. He says, this is what I want done, and so put it here. Place the laver between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. Set up the enclosure roundabout and put in place the screen for the gate of the enclosure. You shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it to consecrate it and all its furnishings so that it shall be holy. 
Then anoint the altar of the burnt offering and all its utensils to consecrate the altar, so the altar shall be most holy. And anoint the laver and its stands to consecrate it. This is an order. God is saying, do it this way, and they will be holy. What if I do it a different way? Then it won't be holy. He wants it done this way because he recognizes the conformity. He can trust me in the little things. Is anointing a piece of furniture so important? Isn't the message that Yeshua gives us in the parables, if you are faithful with the little things, God will make you master over much. But if you're not, then whatever you have will be taken from you. Well, how do we know whether or not you conform to it? How do we know if you can be faithful with the little things? Because we give you something little to do. Every new member of Bethel El takes on two assignments. For six months, you're on the usher team as a man. You're put on an usher team. We'll look at you to see whether or not you're faithful in the execution of those duties. If you're faithful in the execution of those duties, then we can look at you for other things. If you're not, don't come in and say, but I used to be so-and-so and so-and-so. Well, you're not that here because you weren't faithful in the execution of the smallest thing we asked of you. It happens to be the most important job in the congregation as far as I'm concerned of being a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord, being the first face of the congregation that a new person walking in the door meets and greets. It will set the tone and the pattern, the very first encounter they have for the very first impression they ever have of Bethel I think it's one of the most important jobs in the house. The liturgy can be off, but if they have a good impression of the wonderful people here at Bethel they're going to come back. The sermon can be, eh, but if they love the people, they'll come back. People go to congregations for fellowship. People go to bars for fellowship. They go to ball games for fellowship. We want them to come to the house of the Lord for fellowship with Him. You shall bring Aaron and his sons forward to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with the water. Put the sacral vestments on Aaron, anoint him and consecrate him that may serve me as priest. Then bring his sons forward, put tunics on them and anoint them as you have anointed their father that they may serve me as priest. Who did he tell to do this? Moses. Who then came and washed the feet of his disciples? Yeshua. And said, if you do not let me do this, you have no part in me. This was the instructions of the Lord. Was Moses not the head of the clan? Was he not the top dog? Was he not the guy that went and spoke to God face to face? But yet he was washing the priests. Was he not the anointed one of Israel at the time? He was. It gave us the pattern of what was to come. That if we recognize that the greatest prophet in Jewish theology was Moses, the man who was the messenger of God more often than any other man other than Yeshua, throughout all of Jewish history, and he was relegated to the position of washing. Isn't that interesting that the pattern was set in the Torah? So that when Yeshua in Matthew 5, 17 says, I didn't come to abolish the law of the prophets, but to fulfill it, that means he too had to wash those who were anointed to preach the good news. This was the pattern. Those who would go on to do, what did he say? You will do even greater things than I. Moses didn't enter the promised land until much later. We see him again there within the bounds of Israel, don't we? All of you that have been raised up to believe that Moses' disobedience cost him entrance to the promised land, I seem to remember him standing there next to Yeshua in the transfiguration. I see many witnesses testifying to the fact that they saw Moses there in Israel. I guess he made it after all. So you shall bring Aaron and his sons forward to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with the water. Put the sacral vestments on Aaron and anoint him and consecrate him that he may serve me as priest. Then bring his sons forward, put tunics on them. So this was an order. And anoint them as you have anointed their father that they may serve me as priest. Thus their anointing shall serve them for, for everlasting priesthood throughout the ages. This Moses did just as the Lord had commanded him. So he did. In the first month of the second year, on the first of the month, the tabernacle was set up. 
And now what does he do? He set up the tabernacle, placing its sockets, setting up its planks, inserting its bars, and erecting its posts. He spread the tent over the tabernacle, placing the covering of the tent on top of it, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. He took the pact and placed it in the ark. He fixed the poles to the ark, placed the cover on top of the ark, and brought the ark inside the tabernacle. Then he put up the curtain for screen for screening and screened off the ark of the pact, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. He placed the table and the tent of meeting outside the curtain on the north side of the tabernacle. Upon it, he laid out the setting of bread before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. He placed the lampstand and the tent of meeting opposite the table on the south side of the tabernacle, and he lit the lamps before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. He placed the altar of gold and the tent of meeting before the curtain. On it, he burned aromatic incense as the Lord had commanded Moses. Then he put up the screen for the entrance of the tabernacle. At the entrance of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting, he placed the altar of burnt offering. On it he offered up to the Lord, up the burnt offering and the meal offering as the Lord had commanded Moses. He placed the laver between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it for washing. From it Moses and Aaron and his sons would wash their hands and feet. They washed when they entered the tent of meeting and when they approached the altar as the Lord had commanded Moses. And he set up the enclosure around the tabernacle on the altar and put up the screen for the gate of the enclosure. When Moses had finished the work, the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the presence of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The ultimate endorsement that everything had been done according to the instructions in the manner in which it was assigned in the order in which it was supposed to be done conforming to every single detail that God had laid out before them and now it was holy because God said it was so Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it and the presence of the Lord filled the tabernacle When the cloud lifted from the tabernacle, the Israelites would set out on their various journeys. But if the cloud did not lift, they would not set out until such time as it did lift. For over the tabernacle, a cloud of the Lord rested by day, and a fire would appear in it by night in the view of all the house of Israel throughout their journeys. And so God went before them and led the way. Did Moses wander aimlessly in the desert? He did not. He followed the leading of the Lord to go to the places that God sent him for 40 years. Why 40 years? One year for each day until the last of that generation died in the desert. For what God says, he does. And what God says, he means. And if he said it, he meant it. If he said it, he'll do it. It's just that simple. And every example we have within the book of Exodus is an example of a pattern of what God will do. Everything he said he would do to Pharaoh, he did. Everything he prophesied, he did. And so the book of Exodus is the book of coming out, the book of fulfillment of God fulfilling his covenant with Israel, that he would never leave them, he would never forsake them, that every promise he gave them he would fulfill, that he would take them into the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, just as he promised. When we read the story of Joshua and Caleb, we read of two who came back with a good report in conformance to what God had told them. Was there danger when they went ahead? There was danger. But what they brought back was not Lashon Hara, was not an evil tongue, but a good report. And because of that good report, they received the blessing. Twelve men went out, all saw the same thing. Two came back with a good report. Ten came back with a death sentence. Ten died. Two did not. How many of you go to the doctor and come back with the same diagnosis? Some of you die and it's a death sentence. Others live through it. It's a matter of perspective. It's a matter of the report you come back with. They told me I was terminal. We're all terminal. We're all going out the same way we came. It's just a matter of time. And so in this time that God has, what are we going to do? How are we going to follow the leading of the Lord? How are we going to submit ourselves to Him? God's given us a character study within the book of Exodus. He's given us a character study to know that what God calls you to do, if you will do it without question, If you'll be faithful in the execution of the duties he gives you, he will dwell within you. He says there's certain things that we should not do to our bodies. We should not eat meat that's strangled. We should have nothing to do with the blood. 
We should avoid at all costs sexual immorality. We should not eat meat sacrificed to an idol. There's still idol worship in the world. As a matter of fact, the predominance of the world worships idols. What kind of idols? Different idols than they were before, different than Zeus and Apollo and, and uh, Ishtar and all these other idols. They worship money. They worship the human form. Hollywood is the icon for worshiping of the human form. Abercrombie and Fitch worship the human form. Every model that's out there that doesn't submit themselves to God, and I know many models that submit themselves to God, Part of their ministry is to go into that community. It's a wonderful calling. But is that the calling that the world has? It doesn't. We want to be like this. Cosmetic surgery, make me prettier. Because God didn't do a good job when he made me. Well, the truth of the matter is, is God's ways are not our ways. and His mind is not our mind. And when we look at this pattern that he gave us in the tabernacle, he gave us this pattern for a reason. He got very, very specific. He got very specific in the building of the ark, and the ark was part of our redemption, was it not? And because Noah could be trusted, yes, Noah was a righteous man among the people of his time, and Noah did what he was asked to do. Moses was humble. So you have righteous Noah, humble Moses. They were described differently, weren't they? Noah was described as righteous among the people of his time. Moses after the age of 80, was described as the most humble man of his time. So as we look at these attributes, Joseph in Genesis and in Exodus, we see the pattern in which God gives us for character. Who are we supposed to pattern our lives like? And if we take a look at all the attributes as they build one upon another, we're building towards an understanding of who Messiah was. Messiah was to embrace the righteousness of this one and the humility of this one and the attitude of gratitude of this one and the acts of service of this one so that we would recognize in this composite a healer and a servant and a miracle worker and one totally submitted to the will of the Father that regardless of the difficulty of the task all the way up to and including the giving of one's life that he would be conformed wholly and completely to the pattern in which God laid out. Not one detail omitted in his life. Not one act of disobedience. For most of us, impossible. Our flesh gets in the way all the time. But in the service to the kingdom, God wants us to check our bags at the door, just like Delta Airlines wants you to check your bags at the door. Limit your carry-on, and your carry-on needs to fit into this size. And if your carry-on will fit into this size, you can bring it on board. The tabernacle does not exist the way it did then, because they brought the ark into the temple, and then the temple was destroyed. The temple was destroyed after it was defiled and then restored. And the second temple was destroyed. And now where does that temple exist? Our bodies. Being healthy and eating right and doing the right things by your body, getting medical attention when you need it, is conforming to the sanctity of of the tabernacle, making sure that you're creating a clean place for God to dwell. King David said to himself, he said, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. And so God gives us this in the book of Exodus. So next week I will uh, summarize the book of Exodus. I'll go through like we did with Genesis and summarize. And then the following week is our Yom Kippur service, so we will not kick off Leviticus until after uh, Yom Kippur, but uh, the Leviticus study will begin then on the, what's that date, Laura May? Is it the 27th, I believe? We'll kick off the book of Leviticus. 
Now, for those of you who have been with us, you will, if you are faithful to show back up, you will get a mug that says, I survived Exodus with Rabbi Eric. <laughs> the 25th, Saturday the 25th, will be the date of the, uh, of the, the beginning of Leviticus. So if you are uh, called to understand Leviticus, which is great, we just finished reading Leviticus in our daily reading. We're uh, just about finished with, oh, we're finished with Numbers too, and we're into Deuteronomy. So if you want to hear that, I encourage you to come from 9 to 10 o'clock. We uh, are reading the Word, and, and uh, if you've never read it before, and never take this as a chastisement. Uh, if this is the only place you read the Bible, God bless you for that. Okay, if this is the only place you ever study the Bible, God bless you for that. If you've struggled with reading the Bible, many people struggle with reading the Bible. But reading it together in community is a wonderful blessing, and it's a gift from God. And if you've struggled with it and try to be obedient to it, and you try to do the one-year Bible, or you try to do the daily word, or you try to do this and that, and it hasn't worked for you, continue to press on on Shabbat. Shabbat was created for us to receive refreshment from God, and we receive refreshment from God through His Word, through the renewing of our minds through the Word of God. All right, we've hit 11.55. I'm going to go ahead and dismiss. I know that there's a lot of prayer needs.